is that the bill of review has an additional element that the default judgment has to be rendered without the fault of that party requesting that relief for that party's attorney. Now, what makes that interesting and difficult is there's exceptions to that rule, and those exceptions are all based upon situations where there's been an actual deprivation of due process. The bill of review procedure has this exception because that's constitutionally required by both state and more importantly federal notions of due process of litigation of lawsuits. Now something to remember is that that due process and that bill of review right can be triggered in any number of situations. For example, in a situation where a protective order is issued either ex parte or some other situation like that in a criminal matter, in a family law matter. Some of those hearings are ex parte and that in plain English means one party doesn't get to participate. It's without the presence of one party. Usually the party that is claimed to be the abuser or the aggressor and if you don't participate in the hearing that results in a judgment and that judgment becomes final before you are notified about it, you have the right maybe to a bill of review to challenge the finality of that judgment. And that's normally what happens back to that default judgment scenario that I was talking about earlier. It's your standard civil lawsuit, process is served, there's some defect in that process that denies one party notice of the suit, a judgment is rendered, and the party who is in default did not participate in that final trial or that default hearing or whatever resulted in the, in the judgment against them and they've been denied some due process right and therefore cannot, that judgment's not good against them. That's the easiest way to explain it. Actually, that judgment may not be good against them. It just depends on how good their constitutional due process defenses are and that's why it's imperative to get in front of these things.